Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this edition of uh, Verifiability Talk. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Hannah Chuckler. Hannah is someone who has a long-standing experience in uh, formal verification and, and testing. And uh, in particular, uh, she has uh, been a pioneer in the field of uh, causality. Uh, well, so far in academia, but uh, very recently she also took, another, uh, took uh, on another challenge and uh, she is now the chief scientist at Causalance. I hope I, I got the position uh, right, uh, which is a very interesting, innovative company looking at uh, causal inference um, in uh, finance and in energy domain. Uh, but she still keeps some some involvement in at King's College, College London, where she has been. Um, and we are very excited to hear about her story about uh, uh, causal uh, explanations. Uh, in particular, why do things go wrong or right? Uh, this uh, talk is being recorded. So if you don't want yourself to be recorded, for example, your initials or your name, you could enter the meeting as a guest uh, with, with a different name or with just guest, and then your name will not show up. Thank you very much, Hannah, for having accepted our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Muhammad, for such a kind and um, very flattering introduction. Um, I'll try to live up to the expectations that you have built from that. Um, so, um, yeah, so as Muhammad said, um, I added to my affiliation um, a position at the Causalance, uh, which is a company that does causal analysis of mainly time series um, with the plans to branch to other aspects of causality and explanation. Um, and uh, I am uh, in charge of kind of a research agenda in the in the company. So, and I also retain my position, even though I'll be in a smaller fraction of, of uh, time, the Department of Informatics at King's. So nothing I'm going to, to say today is in any way secret or proprietary to Causalens. So it's absolutely fine, you know, to, to record or to share or to cite um, anything that I describe. So as I said, so my, my role is, is on the research, uh, publishable research side in the company. Um, okay, so so let's start talking about why do things go wrong or right? Um, not in life, but uh, in, in the context of computerized systems. In life, I don't know the answer. Um, so the motivation for, for this research is that modern computerized systems are huge and difficult to understand. So if we're looking at the evolution of, of software systems, in particular the evolution of their size, then we go from um, the systems, the software systems that sent Apollo to, to the moon in 1960s, which contained uh, 42,000 of lines of code, um, all the way to um, current um, uh, current software. So, for example, so Facebook has 62 millions of lines of code, Facebook software, and modern cars. Cars run software of hundreds of lines of code, or hundred or more millions of lines of code, and uh, if we look at all the software package of Google, then it's uh, I think approximately two million, two billions of lines of code. So, so they become hu the huge and difficult, and increasingly huge and more difficult to understand, until they essentially black box for all intents and purposes. So we don't actually know what the system does anymore, or we cannot analyze it by simply looking inside. Um, so even if they have white box and the code is, is accessible uh, to us, um, it, it, it won't help because the systems are just too large. So there are important questions that we you want to ask about, about the system, which are easy when the system is small or medium size, but they become very difficult to answer when the systems are so huge. Um, so in particular, can we be sure whether the system is correct? Right, so it's a very important question that we should ask our computerized systems, and especially now when they're controlling almost all aspects of our life. Um, can we be sure it is correct? And then again, if the system is so huge that it's virtually a black box, um, it becomes a very difficult question to answer. Now, furthermore, of course, we are all aware that no systems are correct and the systems always contain errors. Um, and I think there was a um, recent um, talk from, from uh, Google uh, chief of testing that said I have yet to see um, a correct uh, software system or even a good software system and I hope to see one before I die. Right, so now moving on to more realistic setup. So we know that they 
have contained errors, but can we understand and fix those errors, which again becomes very difficult if the system is effectively a black box. And in general, so like we're even more helpless than that. So we ask usually ask the question, what does the system do? Um, so as the systems evolve and become more and more complex, we actually even can lose the, the understanding of what the system does. And this in turn leads in, leads in more errors because um, our lack of understanding of the system functionality leads to erroneous additions of features or uh, changes that we introduce in the system. Now, to, to add even more complexity to this already complicated situation, there are systems that are actually black box by design. They are designed and constructed to be black box, um, such as deep neural networks or deep reinforcement learning, or um, anything that, that has this uh, deep, uh, you know, uh, um, prefix in, in front of its name. Essentially, those are systems that are supposed to tune and train themselves um, in order to, to, to perform some algorithms. And we're not even supposed to look inside, you know, we would rather not look inside because they are very complex. And then how can, can we explain the decisions of these neural networks or this reinforcement learning agents' decisions? Okay, so this is the challenge, and uh, what we're going to do, we're not going to talk about all these questions because all these questions, you know, with the time is short, um, even though I, I have been looking and still are looking into all of them, um, but um, we are going to look at, at, at some, uh, and we, we're going to discuss a, a tool uh, that actually was uh, a very, um, was proven, was shown to be very useful uh, in order to reason about these questions in the context of software systems. Um, and the, the tool comes from the concept of actual causality. So actual causality is a theoretical concept from AI, um, and it, in the first glance, has, has absolutely no uh, connection to, to software systems. Um, and it's filed under reasoning about uncertainty, and it extends causal counterfactual reasoning. So it turned out to be very useful, as we're going to see shortly. Um, uh, but just, you know, this aside, as Similarly to many concepts in the AI, it is intractable, unfortunately. So, so um, uh, precise solutions to questions related to causality are very high on the computation complexity hierarchy and cannot be solved in general uh, for general problems. But there are usually efficient approximation algorithms and sufficient partial solutions, as again we're going to see in a bit. So, going back to the motivation. Um, so, um, so out of this question, so let's start with this one, actually, let's focus on this one. Can we understand and fix errors? Right, so um, my um, research area originally was formal verification, so this is where I come from, this is what my PhD was in, uh, many, many years ago. Uh, and formal verification attempts to answer the question, is the system correct? So we have a formal model of the system M, and we have a correctness specification phi, and we feed them into the model checker, which is a black box for all intents and purposes. Um, so we're actually not going to look inside in this talk, even though I know it's verifiability, so most of you probably have a background, relevant background in verification. But for us now, it's going to be a black box, and then uh, this black box model checker is going to reply either yes, so the system is correct, so we're going to be very happy about that. Never happens, but in theory we can hope. Um, or it can answer no and then provide a counterexample. So this um, seems like a very helpful way to analyze systems because when counterexample is produced, then uh, we, we can um, use it in order to fix the system or the specification. But the question is, do we understand the counterexample? So, um, yes, and do we actually know furthermore, do we know how to fix the system given this counterexample, right? Not only do we understand, but how, uh, can we figure out what went wrong and how we can fix it? Yes, in general, so uh, how do we show the user what went wrong and how do we help them to figure out what they need to fix in the system? So, um, the, the question is actually very hard already for medium-sized systems, and you know, if you had experience with software development or hardware development on this particular example that is currently on the slide, um, you will know that the debugging is a very hard and time-consuming task. Um, but actually, as, as the system grows, it, it becomes unmanageable. So um, what is 
through shown here on the slide is a very, very small, short and clear to understand the timing diagram. No, of course, I'm joking. Um, but but timing diagrams, which are, represent behavior of systems and hardware, so like those little waves, when they say where this is signal, particular signal went up or down uh, in every cycle, time cycle, um, they, they become completely um, mysterious and impossible to understand. So we don't understand the counterexample, and yet we're given it in the form of this complex timing diagram, and we're expected to figure out what went wrong, why this is erroneous execution, and how we fix the system based on this example. So this uh, magic uh, wand of causality has been actually very helpful, and the reason I'm mentioning this particular application is because, first of all, it's a part of an actual tool, industrial tool that is used in industry. Um, and second of all, because it was the first historically. So that was the, uh, I think we wrote the paper in um, um, 2012, I think it was published, the journal version, and uh, 2009, the, the um, conference version. But anyway, th that was quite quite a while ago in, in the um, measure, so in the perception of computer science. Uh, that's like ancient history. Um, and what we've done there is we used causality to show the causes for failure on a timing diagram. So here we have an, an even more, an even simpler timing diagram that describes the failure of the system um, with respect to the specification that is written below. The specification is actually, um, even though it, it looks quite scary, it's in temporal logic, it actually, uh, the only thing it says when it requires, it's very simple, it says that the next transaction can only start um, after the previous the previous transaction ended and we received status valid. So we wait until the end of the transaction until receiving, um, until we receive the status valid and then only then we're allowed to start the next one. So these red dots, um, um, are shown on this um, timing diagram to indicate what went wrong, so uh, so that the user can focus on the causes for failure rather than just hopelessly stare at this counterexample. The causes marked as red dots, and it works. It's really useful. The users inside and outside of IBM actually use it a lot. So the IBM tool is, is called Rule Base. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's used inside for, of IBM as well as uh, outside. So following this work, there was uh, quite a lot of uh, work on causality and, and responsibility in software engineering. And in fact, um, if you um, search for CREST workshop, you, you were able to find it. And um, the, the acronym stayed, but the deciphering of acronym changed a bit. So, but, but essentially, the workshop is in causality in software engineering. This is what it is, and it's affiliated with ETAPS, and there has been a lot of work, um, maybe hopefully some of it inspired by, by this one, by this successful application. Um, and um, so lest you, you thought that we would um, neglect software, uh, so we don't neglect software, we're looking at causes of failure at software as well. Um, and uh, just to give you a brief uh, overview of the challenge, so counterexamples in software, if we thought that timing diagrams look bad, then counterexample software look even worse. And what's presented here on the slide right now is the first and the last state of a counterexample for a tiny program. It is um, TICAS, it's a um, uh, traffic collisions avoid avoidance system. I think that it has 46 lines of code, something like that. It's a tiny, tiny C program, but as you can see, um, a counterexample had 227 states, and they all look like that. So it's it's really bad. I mean, we cannot understand it even for uh, very small software um, programs. Uh, so you know, what hope do we have to understand it and figure out what went wrong for larger software? So so what do they do, right? So what do people do for now software testing? I mean, it cannot be a software verification. It cannot be that that we came and said, well, we we're going to um, explain counterexamples, analyze counterexamples, uh, because nobody does it so far. Right? That, that's ridiculous. People have been writing software for a while, and they do certainly have tools to um, to help them debug software. So the state of the art, and so indeed you would be right if you said that's ridiculous. Indeed, there is a state of the art in software um, testing and software fault localization, and the state of the art is statistical analysis for fault, fault localization. 
um, or spectrum-based fault localization analysis, uh, and it generally it looks for correlation. So element, elements that appear more in failing traces than in passing uh, suspicious, and then elements are ordered by the degree of suspiciousness. So degree of suspiciousness is calculated using some formula that is based on correlations. So typically we have a large test suite and then we analyze which um, elements appear more in passing traces and in failing. And of course we compare um, or we, we get rid of the traces that didn't even get to this element because there can be several paths through, through the graph. But, but this is generally the idea. And of course it works amazingly well because correlation always implies causation. And here is, for example, a very good um, correlation-based analysis that, that clearly shows a causal relationship between number of people who drowned by falling into a pool and the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in. Uh, and this is taken from the site's porous correlation that is that appears on the bottom. Um, so here I can even imagine a causal connection because you know, people just couldn't face watching another film with Nicolas Cage, so they'd rather drown. Um, but here is another one for which even I, I struggle even to think about a possible causal a connection, which is a, a, an excellent correlation between total revenue generated by arcades and computer science doctorates awarded, awarded in the US. So if you see correlation, if you see causal um, connection here, let me know because, because I cannot. Um, and of course, following the same logic, uh, we can uh, safely claim that 5G is causing COVID-19 because there is a perfect, um, a almost perfect mapping, right? There's an excellent correlation between the areas where 5G towers has been installed and the outbreaks of COVID-19 um, in, the, in, in, uh, the, in March last year in the United States. So I purposely took United States because kind of farther from home. Um, yes. So, so that's um, right. So, of course, that, that was very much tongue in cheek, and and I do not do not think that correlation implies causation, or that five G is causing COVID for that matter. Uh, so, we do have ongoing work on causes of failures of software that does not use correlation, but rather more insightful causal analysis based on actual causality. Okay, so let's go back to the slide with questions, and let's look at another application that is perhaps more close to the heart of many people uh, because uh, it, it has been a very active area lately uh, lo looking into deep neural networks. So can we explain deep neural networks decisions? So let's uh, let's think about this question a bit. And actually there is a lot of motivation to think about how we explain neural network decisions because um, it has been a requirement um, from, from standards bodies and uh, uh, from government regulations to add some uh, dimension of explainability to our AI systems or systems that are driven by AI components. So this slide is from DARPA, which is a US funding agency, and it claims that we have to have explainable com uh, explainability components for all AI systems or systems that are driven by um, machine learning uh, components. Um, and uh, since the models are opaque and intuitive and difficult for people to understand, both in the Department of Defense and not Department of Defense applications, so that, in fact, this more or less covers all the in the industry areas that, that we can think of, so like transportation, security, medicine, finance, legal, and military. And the user should be able to, or must be able to ask questions and to get answers to these questions, which is, why did you do that? Why not something else? When do you succeed? When do you fail? When can I trust you? And how do I correct an error? So if you notice, so how do I correct an error? That was um, actually part of the question that, that we focused a um, couple of slides ago when we thought about how do we explain counterexamples and, and how do we uh, use them to help us correcting errors. Um, but, but right, so this other question, so especially the question of trust, they're very difficult questions to answer and yet they are pressing and we have to have to address them. This is another citation from Information Commissioner's Office, this time in the UK, about the explanation of decisions made with AI, and this is part of the GDPR right for explanations. So, um, so let's look at deep neural networks uh, and try to see how we can explain their decisions, again, using this framework of actual causality. So let's uh, look at, it, for example, at the neural network for, that, for classifying animals. So in the training phase, we give this neural network uh, a number of 
pictures or number of photos of different animals uh, labeled. Um, and then, so we trained it for a while. And then after sufficient training, now in this point you might say, well, uh, what is sufficient training exactly? It's again a very good question, sufficient training, how do we determine that? But okay, so after some training that we deem to be sufficient, now we are in the classification phase. Of course, there is a testing phase there that partially addresses the question of, of sufficient training, but then there are other, other problems with that. Let's put it aside for now. So in the classification phase, we have a neural network for classifying animals, and then we give it a photo, and it looks at the photo and says it is a red panda. So this one incidentally is a red panda indeed. But in general, the question is, um, how can we trust the neural network's output? How can we know that what it what it told us this label is is indeed the label? Um, right. So what we do? So what we've done so far? So that was a paper that we published last year. Um, we said so it is red panda because you now we accompanied the label with an explanation. So we said because of this part, this part incidentally. So in this case, it was a panda's face. This is a real result of executing. Re tool on, on this uh, real image with the real neural network. Um, but essentially, uh, what we've done is we, we uh, found an explanation, where an explanation is, we as defined as a minimal, sufficient, non-trivial subset of highest ranked causes. Um, so it is sufficient um, in the sense that if we take only those elements, only those uh, causes or elements of the photo, it, the neural network will classify it the same as the original one. So essentially, if we take this part, this uh, panda's face, uh, it will be sufficient for the neural network to classify it as red panda. And it is minimal because now if we remove one element from it, one pixel or one small set of pixels, uh, depends on the granularity, of course, uh, then it will no longer be classified, oops, sorry, classified as a red panda. So it's minimal and sufficient, and it's non-trivial. So, you know, if our tool uh, wasn't working well or the DNN has been very, very shaky and non-efficient, then we, um, it, it could happen that we need the whole photo in order to have the same classification, but then, of course, it would indicate that something wrong is happening because then it's trivial, right? So, then, so the whole photo is not an explanation of the label of the same photo. So this is, this is what we, we've done. And uh, um, the exp an explanation of labels is actually very important to detect misclassification uh, in addition to increasing trust, right? So the previous slide was how do we increase trust of the user in um, the result of the classification, but it's also, also useful to detect misclassification. Um, and here is an example which is not mine, which is given uh, from, from a different paper, um, and I'll have the... the source there on the bottom in a second. So everything without the source are papers that, that, that are part of the our work and everything with the source. Right? Uh, work of others will have a will have a source on the bottom. So uh, this is you know a very famous paper uh, that described uh, misclassification of uh, wolves and huskies. Um, and it the, the paper is called Why Should I Trust You? Uh, and it described the situation in which the neural network was trained to distinguish between pictures of wolves and huskies, but all pictures of wolves um, that uh, the database in training phase contained were of wolves on the snow and all pictures of huskies with huskies on the grass. Um, and therefore, when in the classification phase, it was given a picture of husky. Um, so it's a, apparently it is a husky. I'm not you know, knowledgeable enough on wolves and huskies to, to say that, but apparently it is a husky. And it was classified as wolf, um, and uh, uh, so that's the paper. Why should I trust you? And um, in this case, you, they could detect misclassification by looking at the photos. So again, they they were more knowledgeable in wolves and huskies, so they knew that this is actually husky. Um, now, our explanations not only will help us uh, to detect misclassification, but they actually they are more sens uh, sensitive than that. So let's look at the subtle misclassification, which was uncovered by our explanations and is something that we wouldn't see otherwise. So um, this is a photo from ImageNet. So that was a DNN for classifying images, not just animals, but general images. Uh, and it was classified as a cowboy hat, which, which actually seemed OK, right? Because it's a child in a cowboy hat. Now, uh, 
we asked for an explanation, and the explanation was as uh, below. It is part of the child's face. So now we see that there is a misclassification here because uh, a child face is no way explanation for a cowboy hat. So this caused us to look closer at the training set uh, for cowboy hat in ImageNet, and it turned out that all of the images of cowboy hats were actually images of people in cowboy hats. So the DNN, um, in fact, trained itself to recognize faces rather than hats. Uh, for the cowboy hat label. So this is a misclassification that the Wolf versus Huskies would not uh, be discovered. Um, you know, this it wouldn't be discovered using the approach of Wolf uh, versus Huskies because uh, to us, to, to people, it looks reasonable that the image is of cowboy hat without an explanation. So now we had an explanation, this helped us to detect misclassification. So this can be used, the misclassification can also be used to answer whether the training has been sufficient. And so the training is sufficient when explanations make sense. Um, of course, the, now we're getting another shaky area of what do we mean by explanation making sense, may make sense, but, but definitely there are some cases where it's very clear that explanation makes sense or, or you know, or it doesn't. Um, so now, so um, we could, we are actually currently actively working on this. Um, there, there's a number of co-authors whom I somehow not not cite here because I don't cite any papers. But the, you know we're working on on this question. Um, and actually, so what we've done recently is uh, we improved our um, explanations by uh, ranking the causes according to their responsibility, which as you see in, in a bit, it's a quantify quantification of actual causality. So, and that was done to answer the question, how to compute this explanation efficiently, this minimal and sufficient subset of causes efficiently, um, because again, the whole problem is intractable, so we're looking for approximate solutions. So we use causal analysis for ranking, in fact, we use responsibility, um, and then we compute better quality explanations when using um, this ranking as our uh, aid or as our input for uh, finding an explanation. And in particular, it also led to uh, solving the problem of uh, classifying a photobombed images, right? It's very, very serious uh, problem of uh, photobombing. Um, so if you look, uh, search your photobombing images, even photobombing dogs, you'll, you'll have um, um, pages upon pages of, of images where obviously dogs or other pets completely destroyed the image. So um, the problem from like scientific point of view is that partially occluded images have non-contiguous explanations. So so this image that you see uh, that I've taken from the internet, I actually don't see the image, it wasn't um, attributed to anything, but it appears on many pages, um, that if it is classified as a dog, then the explanation would be probably dog's face. I didn't run it through through the network, but it would be something like that, which is easy enough and it's contiguous. It's it's kind of a part right of the image that you can cut with scissors. It's one one piece. But if it is classified as, as a photo of people, then an explanation would be something like that, the red one, which is non-contiguous. And if you imagine, you know, a dog jumping in front of group of people, then it will definitely be non-contiguous. And here is another one with not a photobombing, but photographing a, a bus. And then we feed it in the neural network, it classifies as, as a bus. So um, in this case, our tool, our explanation tool, will give us those two pieces on the ends of the bus as an explanation. And note that it's actually it's a great result because it doesn't give us any part of the person in front of the bus as an explanation. So it was able to find an explanation which consists of several uh, disjoint pieces, which other tools generally cannot because they don't rely on this actual causality framework. Um, and finally, we can even uh, give the output in, in a as kind of a heat map or the ranking by people who are used to see heat maps uh, as outputs of neural networks. So here we have a dog hiding behind a uh, toilet paper. Um, I think we wondered whether mentioning whether putting toilet paper on an image is a too sensitive subject during COVID times, but then we decided that that's, that's probably, hopefully it's okay. Um, so this was classified as a dog. 
And uh, um, this is a heat map that represents the ranking that we've done of elements of the picture. Um, and if you so it's um, right, the ranking is uh, the heat is according to what you think it is. So the dark blue is the coldest one and the red is the hottest one and everything is in the between. So an explanation that we would extract from it would probably was, would definitely contain part of the of a dog without any uh, overlap with the toilet paper. So that's more recent, most recent work uh, in the area of using explanations for neural networks uh, decisions. Right. So now that we have some time and we we can um, do some dive um, uh, into a causality or some a little deeper dive into causality. Um, and the the, um, the question that we're trying to answer in this subject of causality is when do we say that A is a cause of B? Right, so that's the general question. And in fact, it has been a subject of research even in philosophy from the 18th century. So I think it's not often that we can uh, cite uh, books from the 18th century or papers from 18th century in computer science, but here we can. So counterfactual causality was uh, first defined, introduced by Hume, who is a British philosopher, in uh, 1739 in his book, A Treatise of Human Nature. And uh, he defined it in a very straightforward counter, um, way as a counterfactual causality, which is also probably how we would think about causality if, you know, asked now to define it. So a counterfactual cause is defined as follows. A is a cause of B. If had A not happened, then B would not have happened. Now, this is a perfect example of whenever I actually give talks in person. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with COVID because I not, we're not leaving the house. But um, I, imagine that if I actually had to travel to, to Leicester to give the talk, then for sure it would have rained, right? Because we're all familiar with British weather. It would have rained and I would arrive completely wet. So rain is the cause of me being wet or drenched with water. Um, this is a counterfactual cause because if hadn't it been raining, then I would still be dry. So in a slightly less hand wavy way, only slightly, because uh, I don't plan to have any formulas on the slide, uh, we imagine ourselves a world in which A happened and then B happened. Um, and then in order to detect counterfactual, uh, causal reasoning, we uh, imagine the same world exactly. So everything is exactly the same, except A didn't happen, and then B doesn't happen. So this is uh, this is counterfactual causality. So it has the obvious advantage of being intuitive um, and quite uh, easy to to define um, and fitting a lot of examples in in real life as well as in computer science. Unfortunately, it is not quite rich enough. Um, to capture more complex causal connections. So I'll just give you a brief motivation for introducing more complex definitions. Um, so, so here is an example. So let's take again this one with the rain. So let's imagine now that the story is more complicated. There is some redundancy. Um, I was ex extremely unlucky. I left the house. It was raining. I got wet. And then, and also at the same time, I, a car drove past me and splashed on me from, from a puddle. So are the, is, is the rain or car a causes of me being wet? Now we see, you see, we have some redundancy in causes. And the counterfactual analysis will not work because had, an, had it not been raining, I would still be wet because car would have splashed on me from a puddle. And uh, on the, in, the, in a completely symmetric way. Um, if had the car not uh, been driving past me and splashing me from the puddle, I would still be wet because uh, it was raining. So it seems like none of them are simple counterfactual causes. So that's a problem, right? Because it would like, I mean, if there are no counterfactual causes, then why on earth am I so drenched with water? And here is another example that is essentially roughly uh, describes preemption. So in this case, um, I left the house at 8 a.m. and then the car immediately splashed, uh, uh, drove by and splashed me from a puddle. I continued walking, being very angry. I think this picture right, is a very angry person. Um, and then at 10, it started raining. So I was already wet and then it started raining. So I continued being wet. And now in this case, we would like to say that there was a preemption. So a car is a cause of me being wet, but not the rain because I was already wet. 
Right, and yet there is no no simple counterfactual connection here either, because I had the car not been driving past me and splashing on me from a puddle, I would still be wet at 10 because, because of the rain. So uh, actual causality, again, this is not mine, right? This was introduced by Halpern and Bro, by two very famous people in computer science. Um, and it extends the counterfactual reasoning by having expressive causal models that allow complex causal connections. So they allow us to define redundancy and preemption and functional dependencies between elements in the model. So um, we're not going to, to define um, the causality um, exactly in the way that they defined it because it's too complicated and again it involves formulas which I don't want to have on the slide. But just roughly speaking, I ju I'll just explain you how we define redundancy because this is relevant for our discussion in a bit. So redundancy is defined as follows. A is a cause of B if there exists some contingency C, which is a change in the current world in which B counterfactually depends on A. So what happens is this. So we have uh, the original world A, uh, original world in which A happened and C happened, and then B happened. And then there is a contingency in which A still happened, but C didn't. So C is our contingency, is our change. And this change brought us to the edge of having a counterfactual dependency. So now C was the modification. So now when we introduce this modification, now B counterfactual depends on A. So now in the middle world that we have here, A happens, C doesn't happen, B still happens. But now if A doesn't happen, then B doesn't happen either. So, so this is the idea of the contingency. In fact, I just I also have to, um, to to mention here that this is not the last definition of cause. In fact, Joe Halpern has his last definition, I think, of a paper that he published in 2015, um, which yet again redefines cause in a different way. Um, but I personally find the one definition before that more intuitive or more suitable, applicable for um, software engineering. Um, uh, problems, so I'm going to stick with that one. Um, okay, so that's a uh, definition of actual causality. And now let's illustrate how it will deal with redundancy. So rain is an actual cause of me being uh, trenched. This is what we want to say. And also a car, right? The redundancy, both of them happened. Um, and this is because in order to show that rain is an actual cause of me being trenched, we introduce a contingency, which is a car. So if if we take the same world, so let me go one step back. So in this particular, in this world in which rain happened and car happened, if we take and we, we introduce a modification or contingency of car not driving by me, then we are in the world in which there is a counterfactual dependence. And now, indeed, rain is a counterfactual cause. So had had it not been raining, then I would uh, would be dry. So this is the idea. OK, so now um, causality, actual causality in itself was very helpful, uh, a very helpful extension of, of simple, uh, straightforward counterfactual causality or human counterfactual causality. Uh, but we need a way to rank causes. And as I mentioned, as, as you saw before, in, in the case of explanations of neural networks, this was very important, right? We, can, we had to be able to rank causes for classification and similarly it's important in software engineering when verification we want to see only the most uh, influential causes or at least we want to see the most influential causes first before the others so responsibility this is a concept again so i'm not citing so that's uh, joe halpern and my work together this again in prehistoric time i think this was first published in 2004 um, so responsibility is a quantitative measure of causality. That's what it is. So not only we define causes and we find causes, but we also um, measure their extent of causal influence on the uh, outcome, and we call it in responsibility. And we measure it by measuring the contingency that is needed to bring it to the counterfactual case. So a typical example to explain responsibility is a voting example. So here we have a description of a um, situation of election in 1864 in the United States. Again, you notice that the farther from home, the better, right? I'm not bringing Brexit, <coughs> for example, to the equation at all, even though it was tempting. But voting example 1864, 
far enough in the in the past. So that's the elections where um, Lincoln beat uh, McClellan. Um, and Lincoln incidentally won both in California and in New York, among other states. Now, I don't know the exact percentages, so this is well, just, you know, in um, just for the case of example, let's imagine that both states had 100 voters each. And in California, Lincoln won very narrowly. Uh, so he got 51 um, votes and McClellan got 49. Whereas in New York, uh, Lincoln won, uh, like uh, they call it, right, and it was a landslide. So he got uh, 90 and McClellan got 10 votes. And we also assume that um, equal distribution of votes, 50-50, a draw is not, not a win. So in both cases, each blue voter is a cause of, of Lincoln's win, right? Because there is, um, they have a causal influence on the outcome. But of course, we want to distinguish between the cases if we want to measure the extent of causal influence. So we would like to say that in California case, each blue voter had a more, a more significant causal influence on the outcome than in New York. Right, because um, the size of the contingency, so what is the size of the contingency in California? So I think it's easier to see that um, the, the size of the contingency is zero because as it is now, each blue voter is a counterfactual cause for Lincoln winning. If one of them changes their mind, then Lincoln would no longer win. So um, the definition of responsibility, one over one plus the size of the contingency, and, and it works, right? So it's a formula, it works. So uh, if the contingency is zero, then each voter would be one responsible for Lincoln win. And here the size of the contingency is 39. I mean, you can try it and, and see that when, if 39 blue voters change their mind, then we are in the 51, 49 case. And each blue voter is one over 40 responsible for Lincoln win. So of course, they have a, a lower responsibility or a lower causal influence on the outcome. Right, so this allows us to run causes, and this is what paved the way to apply this concept in so broadly in software engineering uh, in general, or you know, in the, in the um, ML as well. So, right, so I promise that there will be no um, formulas on the slide, and yet I put something. But this, the, the only the the only purpose of of this formulas and notations is is to be intimidating and scary. So. Um, right, so that's um, nothing else. We're not going to um, expand on that. The, um, so just to say that um, causality, determining causality is generally a very hard problem. It's in sigma two complete, or sigma two is a second level of the polynomial hierarchy. It's it's above NP and coin P. And um, for singleton causes and D two complete in general case, where D two is a difference class, so it's even higher. Between sigma two, it's above sigma two and pi two, so it, it's really bad, right? And responsibility because it calculates a number, it's also in a similar class, but it's in function hierarchy. Anyway, it's all really bad. It's intractable, it's terrible. We don't want to 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 perform the precise calculations ever, because we will know it will not finish. But uh, these are not actually bad news because first of all, there are linear time approximation algorithms. So as many problems that have very high worst case complexity, the complexity in normal cases, so to speak, is quite reasonable. Um, so linear time approximation algorithms are actually accurate on most problems and we tried it. So in fact, the, the algorithm that runs in IBM uh, verification tool is linear time, so it's approximation, but uh, unless your uh, property was extremely contrived. They, they are, it, it, it's accurate. So, uh, you know, those are the good news. It's usually the examples that lead to this high complexity are quite contrived. Uh, and another piece of good news is that we usually care only about high strong causes. So if we think about explaining counterexamples, then we wouldn't care about all possible causes to, to failure. We would only care about those with major influence because remember, we'd like to find the root cause. And then, so we look at the high strength cause, we, we fix them, and then we rerun, we rerun the verification for testing process. We're not going to fix everything and then rerun it. It's not how debugging works. Um, and if we think about uh, the neural networks, explanation of neural networks decisions, again, we don't care about the causes with very very small influence. We just go on the list from top to the bottom, and we try to find the minimal subset of those that will be sufficient to generate an explanation. So, of course, if we bound uh, the responsibility by some 
high number, that you know, by any constant number, in fact, it becomes polynomial. So again, it's it's still fine. Um, right. So that concludes my talk, and I think we're quite on time, right? And I would have time for some questions. Um, Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, there is a little bit of a technical glitch. We don't see you anymore, uh, but we do hear you perfectly. So that's OK. Perfect. Now you see me? Yeah, now we can see you again. OK. Perfect. Oh, good, good. Good. Okay, sometimes so, the, the camera gets stuck, so I have to reboot it. So that's I okay. see. OK, no problem. Uh, so Ivan has a question. Ivan, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Hannah, thank you very much for uh, excellent and uh, very uh, clear talk. So I have a you know little question around this uh, um, causal explanation of uh, deep learning uh, logic in images. So um, I so well, like let me let me say what what I what I guess, and then uh, you'll, you, perhaps you can comment on this. Uh, I was wondering whether let's say this example with the panda which you showed. And if I would subject Panda to, let's say, an adversarial attack onto that image so that uh, there is a small sort of a little texture uh, overlaid over Panda, making the system to actually swap its decision making and uh, like uh, reporting, let's say, uh, not a Panda, but uh, something else. Uh, but even, instead. right? Reporting that it's even. Pardon? Reporting that it's you and not Panda. Yeah. Well, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah so uh so so the question is uh, um, does your method sort of uh, um you know is it sensitive to this uh, adversarial business or not so so actually um it it was not an invited question and i didn't talk with Ivan before but it's it's also <laughs> it's mentioned in the paper uh that uh, we are able to detect the trojan horses in this way as well because so now if we have a result, we have a, a picture that this looks like a panda, and yet the neural network says it's even and not a panda. And obviously, even doesn't look like a panda. Um, maybe I should stop. Maybe I should say it says Hannah. Maybe I, I do. Yeah, but you know. maybe you do. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I wanted to avoid exactly. So that's okay. So let's. Uh, yeah, maybe it says that it's it's Hannah, and not a, not not a panda, and and I don't look like a panda last time I checked. Um, Oh, no, not not sufficiently like a panda. Um, so then when we rank these causes, we will find this area with pixels that is a small explanation of why it's Hana, it's not, and not a panda, and this will be the Trojan horse. So we actually did run it on images with Trojan horses, and we were able to accurately identify this area that was inserted in the image as, an, as a result of the attack. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So, 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 like, what is what is the analysis? Just, just to get a grip. So, is it like, uh, so, how, how how do you rank this uh, causal thing? Are you looking at gradients or, or like? Uh, no, no, uh, we're not. So, we're, we're um, using actual causality. So, let me see whether I can bring the relevant slide to it uh, without um, without freezing my video or something uh, or doing something bad from this sort. Um, right. So. So what happened with pandas is that um, we, we rank the causes, right? So every pixel, we assume that pixels are elements of um, our model, and they have values. Their value is their color, right? Each pixel has a color. And the, uh, the contingency would be covering a pixel with, you know, background color. Like imagine you take an image, a photo, and you cover pieces of it with, with paper, right? With, with brown paper or whatever, white paper with some default background color. It doesn't matter which color, by the way, we, we checked. Um, so what we checked is um, we, we tried to uh, rank the elements by the size of the contingency that is needed in order to create a counterfactual dependence. So um, imagine that, so, so a pixel um, would be counterfactual uh, reason for it being a panda, let's say panda, right? Um, if when you switch this pixel, you cover it with a very small piece of paper, then it's no longer a panda. But it's it's never the case, right? None of the pixels by themselves will cause um, a switch in the um, in the classification. But then we say, okay, so so how many other pixels do we have to cover with this, you know, brown paper? Of paper, background color, so that um, this particular pixel now will be counterfactual. 
Oh. Yeah. So so and then we we classify them according to the size of this contingency. So if the contingency is um, is is large, then they they will be um, smaller. They have smaller causal influence. If the contingency is is small, then they will be more critical. So this is how we ranked the pixels, and then we started taking the pixels uh, from top. To, to the bottom, so we see. Okay, so let's take the first like ten pixels, right? So this will be a small, part, probably panda's eye. Is it sufficient now for the network to classify this panda? No. Okay, so let's add more now. 15, 15 top pixels, right? Twenty. The the the, sec the second we get to a part of the image that is sufficient to be classified as panda, or is Hana in this case, right? Um, then we stop. So this is how we get an explanation. So no gradients at all, right? So nothing like that. It's, yeah, but, 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 but I can imagine, uh, uh, sorry, Hannah, for interrupting, but I can imagine that I can, let's say, select the area uh, of that image as a, as a, like the panda face. And I can constrain my, uh, you know, adversarial perturbations to that image. And I can do it so that every single pixel is going to be playing a role in that attack. So like this contingency in a way argument will be uh, uh, like, uh, will be that that every single place is important and perhaps uh, like actually even more important than than the ones which are which exist in, mm -hmm. in the image then they context. will exactly yeah. yeah yeah so then they will be on top absolutely exactly so so area, like, yeah absolutely this area is very small or even you know pixel size right uh, so yeah. they will be on top right the counterfactual causes are always on top because you don't even need the contingency right so they have the highest responsibility or the contingency is very very small so they will be on top so we will choose them first they will explain why this panda is hana yes and uh, and this is how we will get them. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay, perfect. Uh, are there further questions? We still have a few minutes. Uh, yeah, we have time. Are the there word further for the questions? questions? Maybe before the next hand is raised, I, I can ask a question. So, Hannah, I think it was a couple of slides later where, where you improved the technique, and, and I think it had to do with non-contiguous uh, areas. And you said it led to a better explanation. How do you measure that whether explanation is good or better? Ah, okay, yes, that's that's actually an excellent, excellent question as well. And again, we didn't before. So um, usually there is no ground truth for explanation, right? What do you mean explanation is better? I mean, for me, this is a good explanation for other person that another explanation is better. So what we constructed is what we call the chimera images, uh, images when we knew the ground truth. So we took the panda and we placed it on top of other images. So we had, so we had a roaming panda. Right, it's like roaming gnome, gnome right? It's, it's, we had a panda, and we had panda on Eiffel Tower, panda in the pyramids, uh, panda on Big Ben, and panda in very other interesting locations. Um, and then, if the image is classified as panda, then you don't want to see part of an Eiffel Tower as part of an explanation, right? You want to only have part of part of panda. Uh, so this is how we measure measure the quality of explanation that it doesn't uh, that the intersection with irrelevant things is zero or as small as possible. And, and this is what's about. So in particular, with non-contiguous ones, um, for example, we don't, if the explanation of this is a photo of people, then we don't want the dog, right? Or any part of the photobombing dog in, in the image. Um, or, you know, if it's a person standing in front of a bus and it's classified as a bus, then you don't want any part of the person. Uh, but th th there you rely on on a very good uh, example of roaming uh, pan panda to roam it around so so that it's kind of representative yeah. and yeah. it's not too sensitive to the type of panda you're, mm. you're learning yes yes okay good. Uh, are there any further questions we still have a couple of minutes if there are any further questions is it explained well or awfully <laughs> no, I, th I think it, at least to me it was very clear. So I, I, I think it's uh, the first, uh, the, the former, not the latter. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, then uh, Hannah, thank you very much. It, it was an excellent talk. I think it also relates to, we, we do have a, a number of tasks in, in, our, um, in our project that have to do with uh, using causality. So I think uh, we will definitely benefit from, from uh, several of these ideas that were presented um, today. Thank you again. We will have um, another um, verifiability talk in two weeks, and, and then we will have uh, Radu, who is uh, the PI of the resilience node, and he will talk about uncertainty, uh, which is probably somewhat related to what we have heard today, but uh, maybe from a slightly different perspective.